We're talking to Professor Eugene Kluter, Vice Rector for Research and Innovation at Stellenbosch University, about water challenges in Africa. Professor Eugene, what is the status of water and sanitation in Africa? Well, Mohammed, if we uh, consider the population of approximately 900 uh, million people living in Africa, uh, approximately 300 million uh, of those people do not have uh, access to potable water uh, on a daily basis. Uh, in many places in Africa, uh, it is still uh, customary for people to fetch water, mostly women uh, that have to walk kilometers every day to fetch water. If we think about the Millennium Development Goals, for instance, uh, there is no way that we will meet the Millennium Development Goals as far as water supply is concerned. And in terms of sanitation, it is estimated that at the current rate of supplying improved sanitation, we will meet those goals by the year 2075, which basically means we're not going to meet them with the current technologies. And this will uh, ask us to think of new ways uh, of improving sanitation, but also in terms of water supply to people in Africa. How will urbanization impact on health regarding water supply? Well, in most cities in Africa, we are following the same pattern as in the rest of the world. And urbanization is taking place at a rapid rate. Uh, it is estimated that by the year 2025, 20, 20, that 60% of Africa's population would be urbanized. The problem, however, is that at the moment, urbanization is taking place at a rate which is faster than the provision of infrastructure. So we have many, many areas in Africa, specifically uh, peri-urban areas, where millions of people live that do not have access to safe water. Now, the impact of that is vast. Uh, the diseases that go hand in hand uh, with the non-supply of potable water have devastating effects on the populations living in those areas. So the major challenge there would be to supply water to people in these urban areas or to develop a national or spatial development plan, in fact, which will prevent urbanization taking place at a rate that is faster than the ability to provide infrastructure. But even around Cape Town and Johannesburg and Pretoria and even Stellenbosch, uh, we see this rapid urbanization. The problem there uh, that comes with uh, the water supply uh, is, of course, disease. Unfortunately, uh, we do not have good epidemiological data for the spread of disease uh, as a result of uh, the fact that people do not have potable water. Uh, what we do know is that 80% of all the cholera cases in the world uh, happen in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, the other negative impacts uh, would be that the children uh, would uh, not go to school, for instance. And I'll say something more about that just in a second. Uh, when I talk about the socio-economic impacts of the lack of water supply. It is impossible to supply sanitation uh, or improved sanitation in these areas. So it is a, it's a time bomb, basically. Uh, and uh, not only is it a time bomb, a lot of this is already happening at the moment, where children die, uh, people get contaminated with uh, dirty water, uh, the sanitation is insufficient, and the disease is widespread. And what are the socioeconomic impacts of water poverty? Well, water is paramount for development. Uh, if we want to make a difference in terms of poverty alleviation, the biggest difference we can make uh, is providing people with potable water. So where you don't have potable water, uh, you can't uh, have people that are healthy, and if you don't have healthy people, you cannot stimulate uh, economic growth. So that's on the macro scale. If we go down to the micro scale, uh, it is estimated that in a country like South Africa, that at any given time, about 25% of children are not attending school because of diarrhea directly related to uh, contaminated water. Now, if you take that in terms of the impact on education over a 12 or a 15 year period, it basically means that 25% of the population is not being educated. We have schools uh, in many parts uh, of South Africa, in rural areas specifically, where you would have 900 children in the school and you have two toilets. Uh, it's just not uh, the sustainable. So we really have to focus on getting it right uh, for the sake of economic development. First of all, healthy people so that they can go to work, so that they can contribute towards the economy. And I'm not even talking about the time spent 
on fetching water on a daily basis uh, the, and, and the many, many hours that are lost in terms of productivity because people do not have uh, water close to where they uh, are living it has a major impact on agriculture, for instance. So uh, where there's no water, there is no food. And people are not going to take the 25 liters of water that they fetch in the river, get back home and start a vegetable garden with that. Uh, what they will do is they'll drink it. It's the only source of water that they have. So uh, we need to get the basics right in terms of potable water supply and providing improved sanitation uh, if we want to address the issue in Africa. Who are the most vulnerable? Not only the poor. Of course the poor uh, are uh, most vulnerable. If you could just go to some of the major cities in Africa, uh, and I'm really talking about the center of the city and so on, and the well-developed suburbs, the water is not an issue. It's in the peri-urban areas, it is the poor. But there are also other vulnerable populations. Uh, the elderly, uh, the young people, children. Uh, by the way, one out of every five children in Africa die uh, before the age of five as a water -related, uh, because of a water-related disease. But let's just look uh, at some of the, uh, the other populations which are vulnerable. I, I mentioned the elderly, uh, the immunocompromised uh, people. In sub-Saharan Africa, we have 25 million people that are HIV uh, AIDS uh, positive. Uh, they have no immune system. So if they contract cholera, for instance, they die uh, the, because they've got no way of fighting it. And then, of course, the children. If you take that whole group together, we're talking about a minimum of 30% of the population that fall into that category. So again, it's another 300 million people that fall into the category of vulnerable uh, people. Um, and you take uh, the statistic which I mentioned earlier on, with 300 million people that do not have access to safe water, and it is basically a disaster playing out in Africa as we speak. What are the solutions for Africa? Of course, the obvious answer to solution would be to say, well, get water to the people, you know, pipe water to the people. Um, they say that God gave us water, but he did not give us pipes. Uh, now, I don't think that it's in fact going to be possible to get piped water to the population in Africa, to in the different cities. Uh, it's, and there's a simple reason for that. Uh, the one is that people live uh, in small little villages, in fact, family villages, dispersed very often uh, around cities. So it's just not economically possible to get water to them. So the long-term solution, which can in fact be implemented in the rather short term, is to get off the grid so that you have a decentralized approach. So water provision becomes decentralized. So you have to look there at groundwater. Uh, you've got to look at rainwater harvesting um, as, as a, a source of water because you can take that right down to the family level. And then, of course, the question is, well, how do you get the water potable? Uh, we are busy now uh, developing a system which is proving to be extremely successful, very simple system, where we use, for instance, solar pasteurization. We take a solar panel, we take water out of a water tank that has been harvested uh, from rain, and we heat it to about 80 degrees centigrade, and you only need half a minute at that temperature to make the water potable. Normally, the water is not contaminated that you harvest, uh, from rainwater specifically. So the chemistry is not a problem, it's the microorganisms that are a problem. And you can quite easily solve that problem by pasteurization, uh, which is a very old process, by the way. They've been using this for milk for many, many years. So that is the, uh, that's the answer. But in principle, yeah, uh, we need to find ways of decentralizing uh, the water supply, even in, in peri-urban areas. Sanitation presents a bigger problem. Uh, I think we need to move away from the idea that everyone will have a flush toilet in the future. Uh, it's not sustainable. I think it is a stupid thing to do anyway, to flush a toilet with water that you can in fact drink and then to spend another m number of millions of dollars to clean that water again only to put it back and flush it, the toilet again. Uh, this happens, by the way, uh, because uh, water has no value. Uh, we will have to get a different value proposition uh, to people that uh, use water in the world, not only in Africa, but worldwide. And people might be surprised when I say that water has no value. My argument is simply that if it had value, you wouldn't flush the toilet with it. You wouldn't go to the supermarket and buy water in a bottle, which you pay a premium for, and flush the toilet with it. 
So we need to change the, 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 the understanding of that whole concept of a flush toilet. And we will need, have to move away from uh, waterborne um, sanitation in the future. The answers are not there yet. Uh, many people are doing research in the field. Uh, there are many examples of how this can be done. But the point is we will have to decentralize uh, the way that we supply water. But in conclusion, ultimately, uh, if we want to move uh, the world and develop the world in a sustainable fashion, there are a number of things we will have to focus on. And I use uh, the term of managing wealth. And I use wealth as an acronym, where the W is for water, uh, the E for energy, uh, the A for agriculture, because that brings food security, the L for land, uh, land utilization, uh, the T for technology, uh, and of course H for health. If you take any one of those elements away, you are either poor in terms of energy or poor in terms of water or poor in terms of health. But I've expanded that, and particularly in the African context, I think it is important that the W is not only for water, but also for the empowerment of women. Uh, women play a very important role in education. They play an important role in agriculture uh, and also in terms of the upbringing of the families. And uh, we need to empower women. The E is not only for energy, but also for education. Uh, education is a major challenge. Uh, the employment is a major challenge. Uh, the economy is a major challenge. So we will really have to focus on uh, not only the energy, but also the other aspects. The A for agriculture and, of course, access, which means access to water, access to energy, um, access to, uh, it, to, to the economy and so forth. But access is a huge, huge problem. Uh, land, of course, is important. Ownership of land, uh, I reckon, is paramount if you want to achieve success, because with that comes ownership and value, but also leadership. Thought leadership is important. The T for technology, but also transformation. Uh, we will need to transform the way that we live, uh, the way that we use energy, the way that we use water. For instance, I used the example of a flush toilet. Uh, the H is not only for health, uh, but also for housing. Uh, housing is another big problem. Developing the infrastructure where people have a, a proper house, uh, uh, living in a space that is not only safe, but a place which they can be proud of. So we need to focus on these issues. The challenges are huge. Uh, we need not follow uh, the methods of the first world in order to bring sustainability to Africa. I think we must invent our own future, but make sure we address the wealth issue uh, with the technologies that we develop.